Swami doesn't care even if his name is forgotten, as long as the values live on in people's hearts. That's the important thing for me. Swami is not just that body. I mean, you see it yourself every day. When Swami comes into the darshan compound, you get that sense of an enormous presence all around Swami, that stillness and peace and love and joy. That is Swami. That's Swami, not just that physical body. Swami doesn't care about the body. He doesn't care about publicizing the Satya Sai name. But as long as we live in love, Swami says some of his greatest devotees don't even know his name. So as long as we live in love, that's what I guess keeps me at bay. Swami tests us and if we are mature enough to recognize the test and we learn that, that particular test and pass it, then we go on to a new state. Do you see all tests as gifts to you? <laughs> no, <laughs> sometimes I see them as trials. <laughs> sometimes I see them as trials and sometimes it's like, oh Swami, not now, I can't take this right now, or oh Swami, please, <laughs> enough. <laughs> But Swami keeps, that's His love, the fact that He doesn't let up. Yeah. He keeps testing us and He keeps helping us to mature. A frequent visitor at Sai Baba's ashram in Puttaparthi, India, Sean Brown, an Australian devotee, has dozens of stories and experiences of how Sri Satya Sai Baba transformed his life. Welcome to Soul Journeys. This interview was recorded in Prashanti Nilayam, Sai Baba's abode of peace, in January 2005. Sean, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to get to know you better, and in particular, how and why you came to Sri Satya Sai Baba. Thank you very Begin much. Give us the easy one. When did you first hear Sai Baba's name? I heard about Swami on the 9th of January, 1985. Uh, but the story of how I came to him goes back about three months before that. I was 15 years old and uh, being a 15-year-old kid had snuck out to go to a, uh, a nightclub <laughs> with Lucky a friend boy, of mine. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit, yeah. Bit of a bit of a rowdy. So I'd snuck out to go to a nightclub with a friend of mine. I was staying at his place. So we went to this nightclub about one o'clock in the morning we're uh, walking down the middle of the highway that goes through the Gold Coast, which is where I was living at the time. It's a resort town in mm -hmm. Australia. And there was no traffic, which was unusual. And uh, so my friend and I were walking down the middle of this, this road. And a man came out from the side of the road. Now all I remember is he was short and he looked Italian. He walks over to us, completely ignores me and goes to my friend and says, what's the time? And Reno said, well, it's about one o'clock in the morning. He said, because I've just arrived in Surface Paradise, and he points over his shoulder. And he said, and I've got to find such and such a hotel. Now, I can't remember the name of the hotel, but it was the hotel next to where we had been dancing. So we said, oh, okay, you know, you go up here about two kilometers, turn left, halfway down on the left-hand side, that's where your hotel is. So he said, oh, great, okay, well, thank you very much for that. And then he turned to me, completely ignored my friend, and said, do you believe in God? Now, at that time, I didn't really. You were uh, 15. I was 15. I'd been searching for God since I was about seven. And I'd come to the conclusion that God was so vast that why would He even listen to us? Why would He listen to us when He is so huge? So I thought if there is a God, if there is a God, He probably doesn't care about us. <coughs> so I said, because for some reason I felt I didn't want to offend this guy, I said, well, there's got to be more to life than this. And he sort of just smiled and nodded and said, thanks. Okay, I have to go now. And he walked past us. We walked this way. He walks this way. So we got to the edge of the road and I'd said to my friend, this guy's really weird. I turned around to look to see where this guy had gone. He wasn't there. So that really freaked us out. And we went home very quickly after that. But about three months later, I happened to wander into a little knick-knack store on the Gold Coast. Uh, that set, sold things from Tibet, China, India, South America. And uh, I got talking somehow to the shop owner, who was a South African man. And first we started speaking about India, about some of the things that he had there. Then we started speaking somehow about psychic powers. And all of a sudden he turned to me and said, have you ever heard of Sai Baba? Now, I knew the name. I still don't know where from. You had it somewhere from deep in your 
bad. Like I'd heard it a long time ago, I, I, I still don't know where from. In every interview I've had, I've forgotten to ask Swami. Mm -hmm. So I knew that name and I said, well, the name is familiar to me, but I'm not sure where from. So he starts going on, oh, Sai Baba is an avatar and he's been born in India and he can materialize things by waving his hand. And he has an aura that stretches to the horizon. He told me all these leelas, all these stories. So I said, oh, do you have a picture of him? So he brought out this picture of what to me is an Australian looked like kind of like a Fijian man wearing an orange dress. Mm -hmm. And I, I looked at it and I laughed and I said, you think this is God? Please, come on. I gave the picture back. He said, no, no, really, I'll bring you a book. So the next day I came back, he gave me the book Sai Baba Avatar by a person who ended up being a good friend of mine, Howard Murphitt. From Australia? Yes, yeah. And I read this book. Now, there were so many stories in that book that by the end of it, I thought, there's got to be something to this. Well, that was the start. Once that happened, once I accepted that there, there had to be something to it, I started having dreams of Swami. If I was sad, my room would fill up with the smell of Bhuti. Uh, I would hear the swishing of his robe as he walked around me, sometimes even at school. Uh, one example was the first dream I ever had of Swami. I was on this rickety old bus. Now, I, I knew nothing about India. I knew nothing about what it was like at Puttaparthi. I'm on a rickety old bus, and Swami is seated opposite me, just staring like this, you know, just looking into the distance. And I knelt down in front of him and said, Sai Baba, I have a question for you. Now, that was a lie. I had about a million questions. <laughs> and Swami just looked at me and ever so sweetly said, not yet, not yet. I remember looking out past him before I spoke to him and seeing sparse tufts of grass, reddish colored earth, mountains in the distance. Three years later, I came on my first trip to Puttaparthi and I recognized the place that we drove through in the dream as being part of the trip out to Puttaparthi at that really? time. It I was pointed the same. It, out, <laughs> it was the same. I pointed it out to my friends and said, this is what I saw in my dream. This is the exact place. <laughs> Let's go back for a minute to when you were 15 and uh, you, you saw this man at one o'clock in the morning and you thought he was an Italian. Yeah. Did you ever, since that time, make any connection between uh, that experience and who he may really have been? At that time, no, and it actually took me about 10 years to realize, my God, that was Swami. I forgot the experience for a long time. I forgot about it in its context. And it would have been, yeah, maybe eight or 10 years. <laughs> and I went, oh my God, <laughs> that guy that we saw that night, three months before I found out about Swami. <laughs> what a great story. Yeah. Why you? Why not your buddy? Why not your next door neighbor? You know, I, I went through a very, very bad period in 1991 and I didn't get angry with Swami, but I got upset. And I actually, inside, cried out to him mentally, why me? Why did you even bother with me? What is there about me? I'm nothing. Why did you bother? That night I had a dream, a very, very vivid dream of Swami, where he was about my age at the time. So, in his 20s, and he came to me, he had still the mm -hmm. hair parted on the side. Kind of lopsided. Came to me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and he held me by the hands and he said, I had to call you, I love you so much. Oh. <laughs> I woke up in tears. <laughs> Do you ever stop to think that maybe this is all a dream, just some giant illusion that you're living? Well, it's like that story about the Chinese philosopher, was it Chan Tzu? who went to sleep and dreamed of being a butterfly and woke up going, is this real? Is that real? Am I a butterfly dreaming that I'm Chang Tzu? Or Chang Tzu dreaming I was a butterfly? Mm -hmm. So Swami whether says, this is a dream or not is immaterial. You're living the experience that you believe to be real and you're taking your guidance from this holy man who teaches you. Yes, Swami said recently that when you're awake, that's the waking dream. When you're asleep, that's the sleeping dream. The only reality common to both is the I. That's what you really are. Explain that. What does that mean to you? The I that you refer to yourself as being, whether you're in your awakening dream?